He killed a man that day. Could easily could have been me. And at that moment was when I realized this shit ain't working. I need to make some changes. I need to do something differently. And I got the assistance from a judge who forced me. What's up, freaks? Welcome to episode number one of the Steve Eckert Show, new podcast here, episode one. And this episode is going to be a little bit different than the future upcoming episodes. Today, I'm going to take you along on a ride. In case we don't know each other yet, or even if we do know each other, you're probably going to learn a little bit more about me today. I'm going to let me reintroduce myself. This is the Steve Eckert Show. Obviously, I am Steve Eckert. The Steve Eckert Show is going to be a show on how to flip the switch and have a no-excuses, badass mindset guiding you to adapt, overcome, and destroy the obstacles that are preventing your success, showing you how to operate to dominate in your mindset, your family, your fitness, and your business so you can stop being a little bitch, get your shit together, and start living life on your own freaking terms, all while creating that personal, ideal, freak freedom lifestyle that you've always wanted. That, in a nutshell, is what this show is going to be about. But today, specifically, we're going to take you on a little roller coaster ride, pretty much from the early days of the little baby mini freak Steve Eckert all the way up until current day, just to catch you up to speed. So as we're going forward in the future episodes, you'll kind of know where we're coming from. You'll have a different context and know why we do what we do, how we freaking do it. So this show is also going to be about just transforming men and women from where they are right now in this freaking moment to where they want to be or where they need to be or where they fucking deserve to be. It's going to be about learning to weaponize everything. I love the word weaponize where you can take all your failures, your, your tragedies, even victories and especially obstacles and losses and turn them into wins, weaponizing your weaknesses, taking you from chaos to order in all areas of life. And I'm going to keep repeating that, the, the mindset, the family, the fitness, and the business. When it comes down to it, what do I do for a living? I, I fucking yell at people for a living. I talk shit to people for a living. And you know what? Some people will hate, but most can relate. Everyone needs an asshole like me in their life. That's just the way it is. So let's rewind. And again, let me reintroduce you to myself and tell you this story and take you on this little bit of a roller coaster ride that started 45 years ago, back when I was a kid, grew up in New York, suburbs of New York, outside of New York City, and basically, I didn't fit in anywhere as, as pretty much the poorest kid in school in every, all the schools I ever went to, every grade, I was the poorest kid there. I didn't fit in on the playgrounds where all the kids thought I was a freaking weirdo. I didn't fit in, in even from elementary school where I didn't have any of the cool toys or, or cable TV or, any, or even a, a working bicycle. Had a, a little goat, a big wheel, it was called, where it was missing one handle. So I had to ride with one handle and hold a nub on the other side of the big wheel. So you could imagine the shit talking that would go on. And that led all the way up to high school. I didn't fit in high school because I wasn't a jock, but I wasn't a nerd, but I wasn't some goth freak with the black makeup and the trench coat mafia and all that other shit. I also didn't do any drugs. So I didn't fit in there. I didn't know how to fucking play chess. So I couldn't join the chess nerds. I didn't fit in anywhere from high school and then even after high school. I didn't fit in running wild in the fucking streets, just causing trouble, nor did I fit in when I was in jail with the criminals. That's the quick flash forward of the childhood, the teenage years. But we're going to break that down even further and rewind that again so we can really get to know each other so you can understand where I'm coming from, why we do things the way we do it. What, what, and really, I, I never fit in anywhere until I joined the Marine Corps. Once I joined the Marine Corps in, in 1997, I finally fit in and understood what support and culture and camaraderie and family was. And that's the exact, exact type of environment that I've created in every single business I've done since, from, from working in, in gyms to having owning my own gym to doing in-home personal training to all the different businesses and coaching programs that I'm a part of now that I'll break down here in a little bit. It's basically a, a all, the, all these companies, all this coaching that I do is, is a place where 
people, usually mostly men, but it really could be men and women in, in some, some instances, where they support each other, treat each other like family, have each other's back no matter what. We'll kill for each other. We'll die for each other. We'll do whatever the fuck it takes. And somewhere where everyone fits in. That's what it's all about. Now I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a United States Marine, I'm an entrepreneur, a personal discipline and development, peak performance accountability coach. I've been married now for over 10 years. I have an 11-year-old son, a nine-year-old daughter, and I run several businesses all from home while homeschooling my kids. We don't call it homeschooling, we call it home lifing because we're not schooling them. We are broken free from the traditional way of schooling and we are home lifing them where we're just teaching them about life. That's it. We're just teaching them how to live, how to live their life, how to think for themselves. Completely different way and, and total different way of doing things than, than regular school does it. I've literally coached and trained tens of thousands of people in the last 22 years, both in person, online, and then back to in person, all over the country, all over the world. And, and after an honorable discharge from the United States Marine Corps, I started, a personal, I started as a personal trainer in a local gym. And shortly after, I opened up a boot camp and boxing private training center out in, in New York. And I ran that for 15 years, scaling that to multiple seven figures, literally making millions of dollars in an 1,800 square foot of usable space studio. Since then, I, I own and coach and train in, and instruct in several different successful businesses and coaching programs. I've helped entrepreneurs and, and business professionals operate to dominate, again, in their mindset, their family, their fitness, their business by coaching them and holding them accountable in their discipline, their structure, their productivity, their health, fitness, and nutrition. It's all about helping them improve and transform their, their work-life imbalance into a work-life chemistry, a work-life symmetry, a work-life alignment and fulfillment, a work-life happiness, and how about this, some fucking domination. So there's the recap of where we are, but let's go back. Let's go back to the late, I don't know, 1970s when I was born, 1977. And I'll start off by telling you this. Everything, all, everything I just mentioned about any success or victories, really any m money that I've ever made, I've made now several million dollars when it comes to coaching and all the businesses that I've run in helping other people, I've made several millions of dollars doing this. All the money I've made, all the success I've had, everything I've learned the discipline I have, the structure, the focus, the fitness level that I have, everything I have, I learned from my father. And now you might be thinking, oh, that is, that's such an awesome story. That's a great American success story. But you know what? I learned everything from my father because when I was a kid, and I saw the way my father operated. I looked at him and studied him, watched his every move, and I told myself, I never want to be like that motherfucker. That's what I told myself. Because you know what? When I was a kid, I was a ghost. I was a fucking ghost. I never had one single conversation with my father when I was a kid. Not one conversation. And I didn't move out of the house until I was 19 years old when I left for the Marine Corps. I, I didn't, I didn't, and, and my father and my parents stayed married for over 50 years. My father just died about a year ago. 19 years of living in that house, never had one single conversation until the day my father died. Never once told me he loved me, never once hugged me, never once threw a, a ball to me, never taught me how to play sports or fix a tire or told me about girls. Nothing. A fucking ghost. Never sat on the floor and played Legos with me. And, and now I, I, play, I started doing Legos with my, with my kids. And when my son was maybe about five years old, I don't know about the definite age, but somewhere about five years old, he had this Star Wars Lego. It's a massive 300, 3,400 piece set of Lego. It's for ages 16 years and up. We did the Lego together. He did 99% of it. I did a couple of like the intricate little details of the Lego to help him finish it off. It took him like a week to do it or more, 10 days probably. We finished it. I was like, holy shit, Tyson, that's, that's for a 16 year old. And you did this at five years old, pretty much by yourself. Just a little bit of help for me. I said, you're fucking awesome, Tyson. He's like, thanks, daddy. Where did, he asked me, where did you learn to play Legos? I'm like, I don't know. You're teaching me. He, I was learning from him how to, how to build Legos and to play them. I never had Legos before in my life. I literally, when I was a kid, one time I had a Lego set. It was four pieces, two rectangular blocks and two square blocks. And I tried to take those four pieces and make gun and a knife and an ax and whatever, a, a truck. 
Imagine how fucked up of a looking truck that is with four little pieces of, of Lego. So we're sitting, I'm sitting there with Tyson. I'm like, no one taught me how to play Lego. You're teaching me how to play Legos. And I said, you just did this Lego for 16-year-olds. You're fucking awesome, Tyson. He's, he's like, thanks, Daddy. Did anyone ever tell you you were awesome? I'm like, you know what? Now that I think about it, nope. My father never sat with me on the floor and played Legos or played anything or even talked to me. Nothing. Just mental, emotional, physical abuse. That was it. And, and a lot of alcohol and gambling and, and bullshit. So I told Tyson right there, I was fi- at five years old, I told him, you're fucking awesome. And yeah, I speak like that to my kids. And listen, if the worst thing that I do in a day is the sound that comes out of my mouth is a word that some people don't like, too fucking bad. That's a pretty good fucking day when you think about it. So this, now you're getting a little context of where Steve of today came from. And I was a kid, I'd go out on the, in the playgrounds, I'd wear this Zorro mask on my face. Like literally a black Zara mask across my eyes, thinking it's going to hide me and cover me so I don't have to be around people. I don't have to talk to anyone because I was a fucking ghost. I had literally one birthday party in my life. And I remember in the first grade, I was allowed to invite one person. And I have four older sisters and an older brother. By now, I think my brother was already in the Marine Corps. So I have four sisters at my birthday party. I was allowed to invite one kid from school. One kid. I invited Mark Rossi. I remember it like it's freaking yesterday. It's fucking wild. Right, and Mark Rossi, he shows up, he's got a present for me, I'm like, hell yeah, and he's, where, he's like, where's everyone else, and he didn't wrap the present, it was two G.I. Joe figures, one of them was a marine G.I. Joe, and the other one was like this ninja in like a black ninja outfit, I forget his name, Snake, maybe Snake Eyes, I think Snake Eyes, and he's like, where's all the other kids from our, from our school, I'm like, you're it, pal, it's just you and me, I was allowed to invite one kid, he started crying, made his parents come pick him up, so my birthday party ended up being me. And my, four, and my four sisters, and my cake was this little square pound cake. If you ever had a pound cake, it's basically a loaf of bread. We'd cut the loaf of bread, put a candle on it, and that was my birthday party. The only birthday party I ever had in my life as a kid. The only one. The only time I ever had any friend even over the house or even over for a birthday party. That's just what was going on. And from the Zorro mask to the glasses by, by first grade or by kindergarten, my eyesight and blind as a fucking bat. So I had to get glasses. And I thought there was already enough shit for kids to make fun of me about. I don't have any, again, none of the cool toys, the bikes, or none of this other stuff that I didn't wear the glasses. So I literally was blind. I couldn't see shit all in school all the way up until the 11th grade until I got contact lenses. And I just had to lie and bullshit and, and scam my way out of stuff. My first grade teacher and my third grade teacher was the only person who ever noticed that I, I couldn't see the board, couldn't see the chalkboard. And they called me out on it and said, you wear glasses? And I said, yeah, it was Mrs. Waples. I remember it. Mrs. Waples, first grade and third grade teacher. And when I had her again in third grade, I was like, holy shit, this is the, like my nightmare because she's the only one that ever knew I wore glasses because I wanted to hide it. I was like embarrassed of it. I don't even know for what reason. thought I was going to have something else for kids to make fun of me because my father, again, we're the poorest family on the block. My, everyone knows my father's the, just the neighborhood drunk. We're just the poor, dirty family. And one time this kid falls asleep. It was like, I don't remember what grade, third, fourth, fifth grade. It's all blur. School's all blur. I have zero, zero positive memories, zero good memories from school. But one, this kid fell asleep a couple of rows behind me in class, maybe third, fourth grade. I, don't, I really don't remember. And the teacher's like, Michael, what, what, what's, you're sleeping. Wake up. Why are you sleeping? Are you not getting enough sleep? What's going on at home? Whatever. And he's like, well, Eckert's dad's car is so loud because he hasn't had a muffler in like three months that it wakes me up all the time when he comes home from the bar or leaves early in the morning. And I remember flip, I took the, the desk. I literally took the desk and beat the kid with the desk. I threw the desk at the kid. This was my childhood. This is what it was like. And even my first act, my first criminal act was at three years old in Suffer, New York, we're at the Grand Union, which is out of business now. And I noticed a lot of the places that I've either worked or went to regularly, most of the stores, they're out of business. They went out of business. I don't know if I had something to do with that. Every job I ever had as a teenager, those companies went under because I would rob them fucking blind. But it started off when I was three years old because I was fucking hungry. And they had these little candies, little three cent candies. Remember, right when you walked in the door over to the left, there's all those different buckets with different types of like candies and those little twisty wrappers. They were three cents each. And at th- those days, I'm walking around the store by myself at three years old. My mother's somewhere. We didn't have a car. So we'd walk to the grocery store and had to carry all the groceries home at three years old. I didn't, have a, I didn't have a stroller. I'd have to walk everywhere, miles and miles, and then carry groceries home. I guess that's what kind of where my fitness career started back at two, three years old, carrying, carrying groceries home. So we're there in the grocery store and I see these candies. I'm wandering around and they just have those little twisty wrappers. So they're easy to get off. They're right there. They're 
they're all the way from the floor to the ceiling high on different little buckets. And I'm like, this is, this is easy pickings. So I take a couple of them. I eat like two or three of them. And I'm like, holy shit, no one saw me. No one noticed. I didn't even have to pay the three cents each. So I'm walking around. I go back to my mother. And my face is like bright red because I'm thinking that she knows that I stole these fucking candies. And so I ask her just to make sure I'm in the clear. I'm like, mommy, is there any, you see anything brown on my face? Like anything like chocolate on my face? She's like, no. Why would you even ask that? I'm like, oh, no reason. So she, obviously she knows I'm up to something. What a bonehead move by me. Obviously she knows I'm up to something. So she's like, what did you do? And I, and I end up cracking and I fess up and tell her I, I took the candies and I ate them. She makes me go to the store manager and pay him nine fucking cents, three cents for each of those candies. And then I realized, I said, hmm, I could have stolen that. And if I didn't open my big mouth, no one would have fucking known it. So there began the careers being, of, of being a criminal. And again, I, I never did any drugs. Literally through high school, I was probably one of 5% of kids in the school that wasn't on some kind of drugs. And which is why I had no friends, never went to any football games, never went to any proms or school dances, none of that shit. And all through high school, all through up to this day, I've never done a single drug, never even smoked weed, not even one fucking time. Yes, I've, that takes you right to to graduate of high school. Somehow I graduated high school. I graduated early. I think I was 17 years old when I graduated and I wasn't even supposed to graduate. I only showed up, I I was in a freshman art class, a ninth grade art class when I was in the 12th grade. And I showed up to that class maybe 20% of the time. And the teacher was like, you're going to fail. You're not graduating. You have to go to summer school for art. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? And I told her, I said, listen, if I don't graduate because of an art credit, very, 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 very bad things are going to happen. And I guess she took the hint, whatever that might have meant. I don't even know myself, but I guess she took the hint. And somehow I miraculously graduated. So now I'm about 18, 19 years old. After I graduated 17, a year, year and a half later, running wild in the streets, just causing all kinds of trouble, all kinds of of, of crime and, and criminal activity with both robbing houses, robbing cars, doing all kinds of shit we're not even going to talk about on here because I don't, I don't even know what the rules are, what the laws are about how far back shit can go. But there were weapons involved, there's drugs involved, stealing of drugs, selling of drugs, all kinds of shit going on back then in New York, the suburbs outside of New York City. And there was this time where I was hanging out with a bunch of, bunch of dudes, a bunch of friends, and we're in the, not the nicest neighborhood. We're not in the great, a good neighborhood, a shitty neighborhood, actually. And these two cars roll up. And they're nice cars. Nicer cars than the, the, the shitty Ford, 1988 Ford Mustang I had that had a whole bent window bashed in and a whole door dented in where you had to go out one door. You couldn't even go out the driver's side door. You had to crawl around and go out the passenger side door because it was smashed in and, and I just never got it fixed. So we're sitting there. These two cars pull up. They're both jam-packed with dudes. There's like eight, 10 dudes total in these two cars. And the guy gets out very aggressively and he's asking for some, some name of some dude I never even heard of. And we didn't know who he's talking about, but he didn't believe it. He's getting very aggressive and you can tell he doesn't have the best intentions. He's looking for this dude to do some fucking damage, do some harm to the guy. It's, it's very aggressive and violent. But you know what? I'm like, I don't know who you're looking for. And by the way, I'm the only white dude in the neighborhood. Everyone that I, was, I hang out with were, were black dudes, and all these other dudes were black dudes. I'm the only white kid in the whole town that's hanging out here. So I'm telling them, I don't know who you're looking for, but you need to calm the fuck down, coming out here all aggressive and whatever, rolling up here like that. And he's got his hands in his pocket. He's very fidgety and very nervous and anxious. And so I'm like, fuck it, pop the trunk. And I pop the trunk. We have a, a bunch of weapons in the trunk. It's some homemade spiked baseball bats, homemade Morningstar. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Morningstar is an awesome weapon. I may or may not still have one to this day, allegedly. So I I say, fuck it, pop the trunk. This dude's getting crazy. There's a whole bunch of them. There was, it it was rolling up all all aggressively. I say, pop the trunk. He's got his hands in his pocket. Shit looks like it's about to go down. And they realize they're looking for, they realize whoever they're looking for is not there. They jump in the car, they take off, speed off. And that's that. Later that day, something totally unrelated. The reason why the trunk was filled with a, a, a huge amount of weapons. There was always some weapons in there, but this was like loaded with weapons was we were heading over. I don't even remember the details. So some other dude's house, something totally unrelated. And we surround the house looking for some dude. I don't remember what for some fight. I have no clue. I don't even remember what it was for. How the hell are you gonna remember dumb shit like that? But we're there surrounding the house. The police show up. They freaking storm the place. I end up going to jail, getting arrested. I'm in jail. I'm in the holding cell with 18, 20 other dudes that are also arrested in there. And while I'm in there, I see walking by this one guy completely shackled up, shackled from head to toe like crazy. And they put him in a separate cell, a smaller cell by himself. And it turns out this was the dude that rolled up in that car that was looking for someone that I popped the trunk and was ready to do some stuff. And 
it turns out he found who he was looking for later that day. And he fucking shot and killed him. He killed a man that day. Could easily could have been me. And at that moment was when I realized this shit ain't working. I need to make some changes. I need to do something differently. And I got the assistance from a judge who forced me to, when I was in jail for, after this incident for like a little over three weeks, I was in jail a couple times before that for little small amounts, but three weeks. And he released me with, they paid for the taxi. There's no fucking Uber back then. There's no internet back then. They just released me, put me in a taxi that sent me straight to the Marine Corps recruiter who was waiting for me there. Now, this was back in the, back in the late 90s, mid, mid to late 90s, when Marine Corps recruiters would hang out at the jails and at the prisons and at the courthouses, and that's where they recruit from. Nowadays, that shit doesn't fly. It took me like nine or 10 months just to get into the Marine Corps on the, on the delayed entry program for all the different court cases and, and all the uh, crimes and charges I had and all this other shit. So that... that Marine, they made me, the judge made me join the Marine Corps because of the four-year contract, the Army, Navy, Air Force only were a two-year minimum. He said, no, you're doing either one to three years going upstate to, to jail or four years in the Marine Corps. Take your pick. So they shipped me on this, this taxi over to the Marine Corps. There I go. First time ever leaving New York. First time leaving New York area. First time ever being on a plane at 19 years old, shipping off to South Carolina, Paris Island from Marine Corps boot camp. You know what? I get there. I'm in fucking heaven. I'm in heaven. There was a time there, the, the, the drill instructor, he calls me into his office. They bring in their one-on-one into the drill instructor's office and to have a one-on-one little talk in the middle of the day. And he's, he's like, Eckert, what the fuck's your deal? You walk around here like you're hot shit. Like nothing affects you. Like you don't give a fuck. Like what's up with, what's, what's up with you? And I'm like, well, sir, back at home, I got yelled at. I got freaking physically, mentally, emotionally abused. But you know what? They didn't give me three meals a day. They didn't give me a paycheck every two weeks. They didn't let me work out for hours a day and shoot guns and, and throw live grenades. Like, I'm in fucking heaven, sir. He's like, get the fuck out of here, Eckert. He kicked me out of the office. I go on with the day. And you know what? I gained 17 pounds in Marine Corps boot camp. 17 pounds. Almost everyone loses weight because of all the running and training and lack of food. I was eating the best I ever ate in my life. I gained 17 fucking pounds. It was awesome. So graduation day comes, that same drill instructor, he pulls me into his office. It's like, Eckert, I want to tell you, when I look at you, you, re- you remind me of, a, you're just like a vermin. I had to look up vermin. There was no internet then. I had to look up in a fucking dictionary. I didn't know what it meant, like a rodent. It's like, you remind me of a, ver- a vermin. Every time I look at you, I want to kick you in the throat. He always had a different way that he wanted to violently hurt me. It's like, I want to kick you in the freaking throat. But if I was in combat, if I was in war, you're exactly who I would want in my fighting hole with me. And from that point, I got a meritorious promotion, automatic elevation in, in rank up to a, a private first class, a PFC, which also meant more pay, which was fucking awesome. And there we are. And that again, that time going out to Marine Corps, it was the first time ever out of New York, New Jersey, first time ever on a plane. And from there, getting out of the Marine Corps four years later in early 2001, since then, I have literally coached tens of thousands coach and train tens of thousands of people to help kill their inner bitch, to make them become the best versions of themselves from strategies and tactics that I learned that were foundationally in the Marine Corps. You don't even, you don't even respect that stuff as much. You don't even appreciate as much while you're going through it until after you're already out. So I guess you could say the Marine Corps ch- say, changed and saved my life. So every company, everything that I've been in business that I've had since then has been the focus of saving and changing, usually men's lives, but really men's and women's lives because it's affecting their families, it's affecting their kids so that I can help people have those same types of transformations. And, and listen, my life, I did it completely backwards. After I got out of the Marine Corps, got a job as a personal trainer. We did shit backwards. Me and the Russian, me and my wife, the Russian, we first moved in together. Then we had a kid. Then we started a business. Then we got married, then had another kid, then bought a house and then moved from New York out here to California where we are just living our ultimate freak freedom lifestyle, being our freak selves, living life on our own motherfucking terms. And now involved in so many different programs where we, I take the lessons learned from a fucked up childhood, the lessons learned from the, the Marine Corps, leadership, teamwork, communication, problem solving, lessons learned from entrepreneurship, from first working at a corporate big company to working on my own, running into doing in-home training, to opening up my own gym where we had multiple locations and scaled it to 
seven figures to now all online coaching and the all the in-person programs we do. Now it's all, every one of those revolves around the same strategies and tactics I learned basically from the military, from entrepreneurship, and from the family life, both the fucked up early family and now the fucked up the family afterwards of being a husband and a father. And there's the OTD, the Operate to Dominate, Personal Discipline Development, one-on-one coaching. There's the Alliance, that's group coaching for entrepreneurial spouses and their partners. There's the LTD, which is Leadership and Team Development Project for its corporate training and events for companies and their teams. There's the project, the project, which the first tattoo I ever got in my life is of the project. I didn't get a, a tattoo in the Marine Corps. The first tattoo at three, about three, over three years ago, at 41 years old, the first tattoo, a logo of the project right on my hand. That was after the very first class of the project. After we saw the impact it had on other men, the impact it had on me, myself as an instructor, the impact it had on my, my, my family and my kids. That's how fucking impactful it was that I got a tattoo on my hand after only one class. And here we are in a couple months going into class 17, three and a half, four years later. The project is a, a four-day immersive personal development, violent Violent, all I can say is like a violent therapeutic experience for men. Then there's also the Squire program, which is, in, is built, is a the little sister of the project. And that's the Squire program. It's an in-person one-day event for fathers and sons to have a, a, an immersive rite of, passage, rite of passage experience for those young boys, 13 to 15 years old, as they start moving into manhood. Then there's the Masogi Challenge. It's an in-person one-day physical mental challenge experience for men and women where they're finding out what they're truly capable of physically, mentally, and emotionally doing hard shit. And there's Operation Black Sight, which is weapons and self-defense, in-person, immersive experience also for men and women. All this stuff has, has been a result. And all these are successful businesses, companies, all a result of first this fucked up childhood, these, this crazy life after graduating, barely graduate high school, that, that street, violent street life, into the Marine Corps, into the personal training, coaching business, into starting my own business, into then expanding and growing into multiple areas, both online and in person out here in California. And I'll tell you what, motherfucker, we are just getting started. We are just getting warmed up. And that's what this show the Steve Becker Show is going to be all about taking all of these lessons and helping you not make the same fucked up mistakes. So you can almost like freak time travel. You could skip all this bullshit and take it and use this to your advantage. And that's what's going to go on in these episodes every, each, each week of the Steve Eckert Show. Again, it's to help you flip the switch. So you stop bullshitting and stop having excuses in your fucking head. And you can have that badass killer mindset. So you can adapt and overcome and destroy the obstacles, the roadblocks, whatever the fuck is in your way that are stopping you and preventing your success in your mindset, in your relationships, in your fitness, in your business. So you how to operate to dominate in all those areas so you could stop being that little bitch. Get your shit together. Start living life on your own fucking terms. It's all about living your ideal freak freedom lifestyle. And all these different aspects we're going to go much deeper into and break down the foundation of this every week. We are going to do deep dives every single episode. This is just to let you know what this show is about to reintroduce you to me on the Steve Eckert Show. So I want to thank you for joining me on episode number one of the Steve Eckert Show Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this with a motherfucker that needs to hear this kind of message. Because listen, everyone's not going to like what I'm saying. Most people or some people will hate, but most can relate. And I can guarantee you, everyone or most people need to fucking hear shit like this. They need that asshole in their life. That's not going to bullshit. That's not going to half-ass. That's not going to be a yes man. That's not going to tell them what they want to hear. It's going to tell them what they motherfucking need to hear. And that's what I'm going to be here. If I'm doing my job right here on the Steve Eggers Show, that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to help you have, break you down mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually, so you can be built back up and have breakthroughs. It's a breakdown to build up and break through. That's what's going to happen on the Steve Eggers Show every single episode. So thank you for joining me. Again, share this, like this, subscribe to it, send it to your mama. We'll see you next time. And in case no one told you yet today, you're fucking awesome. No excuses.